close enough to or whatever. Yeah. Oh, it's picking up good. Yeah, That's it great. Is. Today, okay, is, yeah. Yeah. today is May 31st, mm -hmm. and I'm Chris Payton, and I'm here with Ray Evans mm -hmm. and Jay Livingston, and we're going to talk about Johnny Mercer, and we're doing this to check and be sure that we're getting a recording here. Okay, um, the first question that I'm asking everybody um, in these interviews is how did you meet Johnny Mercer? And why don't we take you one at a time? Well, we came out here from New York. I'll skip all the details. Yeah. Okay. We finally got a job at a studio called PRC, Producers Releasing Corporation. Our first job in Hollywood. Yeah, and Martha Tilton was the star. She was a singer with Benny Goodman. And uh, we wrote the score. Yeah. And Johnny Merch was president of Capitol Records, and she was a Capitol artist. So he had to listen to the songs as a courtesy to her. And he didn't pick any for her. But uh, we started to hang around at Tropics where he went between shows. He used to do two network shows. He was on five nights a week. Radio. Radio. Yeah. Johnny, one, Johnny Mercer was yeah, on five Mercer. nights a week. Oh, one, called Chesterfield one, Music Hall, wasn't it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And one for the East and then went three hours later for the West. So they had to go across the street and drink and eat. Mm -hmm. And they got pretty loaded on the second show. Key Club. It was a Key Club member. Yeah. Uh, I heard it. A recording that Ben Wallach said when the drummer fell off the back of the stand. You know, never really <laughs> sound like that in your life. Yeah. All the broom. Anyhow, so I was in there, we went in there every night after that just to let him know we were alive. And he used to say beep beep because we had a song with a beep beep in it. Called the Highway Polka. It was yeah. in the picture, right? One day we got a call from Capitol that Johnny wanted to do the Highway Polka on his radio show. Mm -hmm. Out of clear blue sky, we had no idea it was going to be done, so that would be our first performance, you know, on radio. Then went, all I remember is, here the highway polka, beep, beep, that's how it started. <laughs> he did it and mentioned our names, which was important for us, you know. Yeah. And he did it several times, not only once, two or three times, always mentioning our names, so that started to open you know, uh, the doors for us. So we decided to write a song for him. We had an opening now. We wrote a song called The Cat and the Canary. The cat was a musician, the canary was a girl singer. And we waited all day, and he went out the back door in his office. Mm -hmm. They went the next day, got to know his secretary real well, and she finally said, Johnny, these boys have been hanging around here, you got to see them. So I sang the cat and the canary for him, and he did it on his radio show, mm -hmm. next couple days later. And I mentioned our names. Mentioned our names. Yeah. And then next time we wrote a song called uh, Band, Band, Baby. Band Baby, about the girls that hung around the Bobby The song. groupies, yeah. And I remember that when the name was a band baby, you see the grand baby and leaning on the baby grand. We were, we were copying Mercer's style. That was just kind of a lyric. It's, you know, why don't you say a little bit of a cat and a canary too? He was, he was a cat, she was a canary, and the kind of snazzy, so the jazzy, sat and my tazzy, something like that. Kind of been a lot yeah. of rhymes, you know. Which Johnny was famous, famous for. This time we walked in because mm -hmm. he knew us and he knew we, could, we could write pretty well. And he did that Band Baby on his show. Did both of them, Cat and the Canary and Band Baby, several times, always mentioning our names. So we were getting, you know, semi famous in, on, on Vine Street. Yeah. Got to who are these guys? Johnny's singing their song. Yeah. You know? And we got pretty close to Johnny. Uh, I guess the next thing when Buddy De Silva at Paramount was doing a picture, Betty Hutton picture called. Stork Club. Stork Club, right. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said he wanted, he didn't want to hire writers. He wanted to hear the songs first. Yeah. So May I interrupt a minute? Buddy DeSilva was a very famous songwriter, DeSilva, Brown, and Henderson, who also had been head of production at Paramount for a while. Now he's doing his, uh, uh, as a uh, specialized producer, special producer, he was doing pictures on his own. And before that, he had produced several big Broadway shows that had been big hits. So he had run into every gamut of show business. So now pick up where uh, uh, everybody he, song, he bought songs from uh, Hoagy Carmichael and Sammy Kahn. But he needed something special for Betty Hutton to be written. So he said to Johnny, do you know any young songwriters would write on speculation for Betty Hutton? Mean, the big writers wouldn't do that because you don't get paid if they don't use it. What does speculation mean? That, that means you don't get paid. You, you don't, don't get paid. If he doesn't like it, you don't get paid. You're doing it on your own. You're not signed. You don't get a salary or whatever. And so he's not investing anything, but he will pay you if he decides he wants to use it. But as Jay said, a big writer wouldn't work that way. No. So he needs somebody who you know, hadn't made it yet to see if they want to take a chance. 
And Johnny recommended us, which started our life. We wouldn't be here now if it wasn't for that. That's for sure. We would be talking to you. <laughs> yeah, we wrote a song that uh, the, the Buddy the Sober Light. We wrote had, three of them. Yeah, but only one was in the movie. That's that, right. That's what we wrote three over a weekend, which you don't do. <laughs> You're lucky if you can write one song for Betty Hutton in three weeks because she was so specialized and so dynamic. Anyway, we figured that this might be the big opening for our career and just knocked ourselves out with all the inspiration we could, wrote three songs, and one of them was finally accepted for the movie and uh, uh, then we got to Paramount uh, a few weeks after that we were offered a job there but it all started with Johnny Mercer so yeah. he was really our uh, our guru and uh, our what patron saint. We were offered the job to write songs for the short subjects because the big writers wouldn't do that and no. we had to sneak in the side door. Right. We went over to see the head of the music department and he said we need somebody to write these songs for the shorts would you want to work here? Well, we almost fell off a chair, but sure. we didn't show him. He said, well, yeah, that'd be nice. You know? Sure. And uh, he said, I only pay you $200 a week, but if you do well, we'll prove that. On the way out, I said, is that 200 mm -hmm. pieces? I was afraid to ask him. We didn't even know. We got our first check. Well, we did, but really having a job and a salary for writing yeah. songs, my God, that was a dream world. And But I, the purpose of this interview, it all started with Johnny Mercer doing the highway polka beep beep on his show and then letting us in to play other songs for him and eventually led us to Paramount. I'm recommending us to the guy at Paramount. Sure, yeah. that's right. And we stayed there for 10 years, mm -hmm. so, you know, it worked. And our first first year there, we were asked to write a title song for a movie called To Each His Own, which was probably the biggest hit of the decade. I don't know if you'll remember it or not, but uh, tremendous, tremendous hit. In fact, one, uh, several consecutive weeks in 1947, five of the ten top selling records in the United States were different versions of To Each His Own. Incredible, that never happened before and it could never happen again. So uh, uh, it all, you know, gravitators would keep saying from Johnny Mercer into having the head of the decade really in 1947. You see, nobody knew that expression. It came out of a poem. And Dick T. Young was assigned to write the song. He wouldn't do it. He's a great songwriter. I'm not going to write a song with a dumb title like that. Mm -hmm. That song put the phrase into the language. Everybody says to each his own now. Before we wrote that song, they didn't. Oh, that's for sure, yeah. Yeah. Now, that's for, that's our Johnny sure. Mercer beginning. Now, Johnny became good friends. Yeah, we became social friends from that point. Yeah. I used to go to parties together and, you know, go to dinner and things like that. They used to call us, there's a great piano player somewhere. He used to discover people, you know. And we'd all go out and hear him. And he loved jazz, so these, you know, when there's a good jazz player around, he gravitated toward this person. He found that Cole playing downtown, an old joint. You are right at Johnny yeah. right now? Huh? Did Johnny find that? Oh yeah, oh, down in downtown. Oh, well, he'd become a real legend, a la Johnny Mercer. Sure. Yeah, and uh, Johnny made Capitol Records what it was. See, there were only three record companies, Victor, Columbia, and uh, Decca. Decca. Mm -hmm. And Capitol was an upstart, but he brought all these great talents in. Yeah, unrecognized talents. Yeah, right? and Capitol became a very important label on account of him. Martha Till, Martha, Martha Whitey, uh, Martin. Margaret Whiting, uh, Freddie Slack, Joe Stafford, Joe Stafford yeah. Paul Weston, my God. Yeah. You know, because Johnny, you know, had taste and new music, so Capitol Records, you know, would not be the behemoth and the giant that it is today if this little record company had to start with Johnny Mercer, Buddy De Silva, whom we mentioned before, and Glenn Wallace, who owned the biggest music uh, store in, the, in Hollywood. And, so and they invested $2,000 in Is that all it was? Yeah, yeah that's what I heard. Today it's a hundred, hundreds of million corporation. Yeah. Now when it got big, Johnny lost interest. Yeah, that's right. It was a toy at first, he yeah. loved it. I mean, he sang too on it. Sang oh, sure, great his great. record sold very, very big. Yeah. yeah. And uh, after it got big, he lost interest. It was beyond him. It became big business. It was not the artistic thing that he wanted it to be and he originally conceived of it as. So he kind of just, just dropped out, sold his stock or whatever and of course it went on and on from there. And but they had to find him because he wasn't ever around because he had to sign things. He was the president. Oh, was he, even and when it got as getting big? He, they had a tough time for a while though, oh, really? because he had to sign papers, yeah. you know. Mm -hmm. Uh, and also he was living in Palm Springs part of the time and he had a home in Bel Air and I think they had an apartment somewhere in Hollywood so you know we're quite sure where Johnny would be at any particular time. Let's go back, you said that you saw him socially after, after yeah. you right. got to know each other. Yes. What was it like 
you know, if he called up and said, let's go somewhere. Or he did happened? that with Jay. He never did that with me because, I mean, Jay's a musician. I'm not. So he'd know they, they'd be in tune. And our social things are more formal, but the, Jay could tell you more about that, about the social part of the music world with Johnny. Well, we had, well why don't you tell and then you tell All right, us. fine. Okay. Hey. Mr. Livingston. We had uh, Johnny and Ginger up here for a lot for parties. They lasted all night. In the morning, about eight o'clock, Johnny would make scrambled eggs. You know. Oh, he could cook. <laughs> oh, he was. That was. Don't you know that? That no. was a big hobby. No, I didn't know that. But we had a suppressed desire party. Everybody came as what they wanted to be. He oh. came as a chef. Oh my God. Really? Yeah. But I um, mean, it went on all night. Hmm. There was a girl up here, talking, telling wonderful jokes, and he never introduced anybody. I found out that she was L.M.A. Morris later. Oh, really? She's a good singer on Capitol. Yeah. Whatever happened to her? She I don't know. Around? Yeah, yeah. Anyway, it's good to be for interrupting, yeah. But it was fun to be around Johnny mm -hmm. because we had, we had the same tastes and interests, you know. And you used to go to shows in New York with him when you were in New York? Yeah. You know, used to go to the cabarets and hear the jazz people, as you say. Yeah. And, and he was a close friend. Yeah. My wife and he got along very well. They liked each other. She came from Oklahoma, and he understood that kind of a country she wasn't really country, but they understood the kind of... And she was a great jazz fan, too, yeah, so they, they had that rapport. They understood the patois and the funny expressions, you know. Mm -hmm. Georgia and Oklahoma are not that far apart, you know. <laughs> oh, it's south. At least culturally, anyway. Yeah. They're both rural, I think. There's, Pardon? There's more rural. Yeah, yeah. oh yeah, sure. It's mm -hmm. the south, you know. Mm -hmm. Oklahoma's south, really. Oh yeah, ways. sure, of course. I mean, it's sure, it was part of the South, although it wasn't a state in the Civil War, but it's still the culture in the ambience here is, is more or less Southern. Oh, uh, that's about all I can tell you because we had we had fun, mm -hmm. you know. We yeah. loved to have Johnny come over, and he'd sing. They used to bring Gene DePaul with him, who played for him, and he would sing songs that nobody ever heard, you know, that that he'd written, mm -hmm. or maybe songs that he liked that he had unearthed that somebody else had written. Too. He sang a song, yeah. He yeah. sang oh, "Poor Little Robin in the Rain." I never heard it again. Yeah. And he used to sing a cottage for sale a lot, didn't he? Because he liked uh, the guy who wrote that. What? A cottage for sale? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, that was one of his favorite. Well, yeah, yeah, sure, yeah. He had a, he could talk Gullah, which is a southern oh, sure. talk, and it was wonderful. Yeah. He just closed his eyes and take off. Yeah, yeah, there's a show now in Los Angeles. It's got great reviews based on the Gullah culture. It's in one of the small Broadway theaters, small theaters here. It got a wonderful review just this past, this week, uh, uh, on the Gullah culture and the Gullah yeah. life, yeah. Okay, and we see how well, I can't go as much detail because we never, I didn't have that much, my wife and I have that much contact with Johnny, but when we had a little formal dinner party, we always had one big New Year's party uh, every year. That's our big party. We invite all our friends that we haven't seen during the year. And Johnny and Ginger always used to come. And we were so glad that they did because most of the crowd was not show business. And to have Johnny, you know, a celebrity and such a great artist there uh, was very flattering to me. He would care enough to come. And, uh, and uh, every once in a while they'd invite us to their house for dinner or whatever and stuff. So that's really my relationship. As I said, I'm not the musician Jay was, so I didn't really have that much interest in the jazz world. If he wouldn't called me when he said, let's get together and do something, but uh, uh, w between us we had a, a well-rounded uh, relationship. Uh, in my opinion, he was the best of all the lyric writers. Because of I mean, out here, yeah, but anywhere. He, well, I mean, he wasn't the, I don't think he was a Cole Porter. And what I'm trying to say, he was better than Cole Porter. Uh, well, because Cole Porter wrote all sophisticated. Right, sure. And Johnny wrote everything. Uh, well, so there was more variety in his Yeah, it could be. Uh, and we would say, what would Johnny do when we were writing? You know, mm -hmm. what would Johnny do here with this? You know, because he was our guru. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was very important to us. Yeah, but, you know, the, one of the sad things in his career is he never had a hit Broadway show. No. And I'm sure, you know, he had so much success in the pop world and the Hollywood world. And he hit Broadway several times, but never, never, a, no, an outright disaster, but never what you would call a Cole Porter, Rogers and Hart, and a, you know, or George Gershwin kind of show. And uh, I don't know if that was a, a thing that uh, made him unhappy or not, if it was a trauma for him, but uh, that was the one world he never did conquer for whatever reason. When I say he was better than Cole Porter, I don't mean Cole Porter was bad. Oh, no. He had more variety. Yeah, well, that could he be. He could write comedy, he yeah, could write yeah. beautiful Well, Cole Porter wrote some pretty good comedy. Yeah. Plus, he did Country and Western, Don't Fence Me. Yeah, you know? I guess so. He did tr but Johnny did a lot more of it. That was yeah. the difference. To Monday's work, Cole Porter would just do it every once in a while. Yeah. When he writes lines like, uh, When my life is through, and the angels ask me to recall the thrill of them all, then I'll remember you. That's beautiful. Mm -hmm. Gives you goose pimples. And yeah. blues in the night, my God. Oh, yeah. yeah. Folks on the wall of time, you know, yeah. the rhymes and everything. And well, they still play a lot of Johnny Mercer 
records that he made himself on the, the one good music station here that plays the old time jazz. And every once in a while I hear something that I'd forgotten or really never heard before and they, oh my God, what a great, you know, lyric writer and a great artist Johnny Mercer was. And, uh, jealously I said, uh, jealously I would feel, gee, I wish I could have written something like that. But, uh, you know, it's just wonderful what you hear some of these old Johnny Mercer things. The rhyme, gee, I jive, I keep hearing that a lot. And the rhymes and the comedy, as you say, you know, yeah. the, uh, the during the war, what, what that said was just great, just wonderful. Satin doll, mm -hmm. and that, that yes, satin, yeah. you know. Etc. It's a positive. I just love that. You know, and it's just real gospel, real religious kind of thing. But what a beat! What a, you know, it just rub, it takes you out of your seat when you hear Johnny and the Pipe Pipers on their record of that. Actually, Topeka Santa Fe was a wonderful song, you know, kind of semi folk, just great. So somebody told me they went to a psychiatrist one meeting. Yeah. And the guy said you have to accentuate the positive. Oh. And that's where you got the title. Well, whatever he sure yeah, wrote it great. Sure yeah, did. sure. Of course, Harold Arlen had quite a bit to do with that too. You know? Yeah, of course. With the well, word Harold Arlen and he were a great team. They certainly were. Yeah. Somebody with Harry Warren, he did some good songs. And, it was a great. And of course, he wrote his own songs every once in a while. And that always amazed me because he wasn't a musician. He couldn't write music and he couldn't read it yet, but he could hum or something, and somebody else would write it down, and it turned out fine. And of course, there are a lot of people. Frank Lesser could read, uh, write music. Uh, uh, Rod McCune can't write music. You know, there are a lot of people. Rod McCune, yeah, can't write music, but still they can have success as songwriters. So it isn't that. But if you can write, read, and write, and you know, as a musician yourself, you know, you're a lot better off. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> it makes it a lot easier. Did you ever write a song on a viola? Did I ever write one? Uh -huh. On the viola? Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah, well, we had to in school. Oh, you did? You know, we had to take a out popular a song or a classical theme or what? Uh, generally classical. Yeah. It's easier. We're going to get back to Johnny. Okay, <laughs> sure. Yeah. Are we might have written lyrics to it if we were here today, to your theme. He probably could. Yeah, he'd probably, probably written very good could. ones too. But Paul I'm Weston sure used to say he would write with any the first guy that showed up in the morning. But he enjoyed it. He wrote so. with everybody. Sure, he just enjoyed it. That's why you've got such a list of names that people have had their lives affected by Johnny Mercer. So many people I met, songwriters, I didn't realize that Johnny helped uh, me yeah. this time. I didn't know about Jack Siegel or, or Bobby Troop or you know Bob, or Bob, Bob, Bob Russell. Bob Russell too? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And he was he was so secure in his talent yeah. that he didn't mind helping people. And he wasn't jealous. No, he That's wasn't fair. Yeah, sure. Which temperamentally was great, you know. And uh, he would appreciate something good, you know. Mm -hmm. And that's how we broke in. Mm -hmm. We must have written something good. Well, uh -huh. he, at least he thought so. And yeah. they say we wouldn't be st here talking to you if it hadn't been for that. Help Johnny Mercer gave us up the ladder, et cetera, et cetera. You know, one of the ironic things, we wouldn't have had our job at Paramount if it wasn't for Johnny Mercer, the recommendation, et cetera. And our big, big song, which solidified our place there for maybe 10 years, was To Each His Own, which I mentioned before. Johnny hated that song and wouldn't record it. Capital was the only company that didn't like the song and didn't record it. So that's, you know, how ironic life can be. Everybody wow. else, you know, did, I say, five of the top ten records, the other companies uh, for several weeks for version two weeks ago, but none from Capital. No Johnny Capital didn't record. Like it. No, no didn't Capital like record. It. Which was his taste, fine. And he could have been, might have been a lousy song. But anyway, so ironic that we wouldn't have had a chance to write if it wasn't for Johnny. And they, that was the one company who didn't record it. Yeah. Which is well, I, I played Mona Lisa for him when he was living next door at my brother's house. Yeah. And that's a pretty song. He said, I don't like it. Oh, he did say it. Line. Yeah, sure. <laughs> and, they didn't, and Capital was never going to release Mona Lisa. You know, that's probably our most prestigious hit. They were never going to release it because they didn't like it and the people, Johnny wasn't running it then. No. They finally put it out as the B-side of what was going to be Nat's biggest hit. A religious song called The Greatest Inventor of Them All. And when they took their trade paper ads on the record, they didn't even mention Mona Lisa just said, you know, greatest inventor of all, biggest record Nat Cole ever had. Anyway, for our luck and everything else, the record came out and the radio stations, this Jackie started to play Mona Lisa and the rest was history. But uh, so that was two, was two of our biggest hits, which is on uh, Captain did record. And uh, Mona Lisa, Johnny said, uh, it's a nice song, but I don't like it. Yeah. I, I got to think of some more mercy to but I think I've told them all. Yeah. I mean, well, I've yeah. got some other questions. What? Um, when Mercer came out here, he was uh, fairly early on signed at Warner Brothers. And yeah, right, sure. And then Honeymoon right. Hotel, things like that. You know, movies, yeah, Benny Goodman was doing the picture, yeah, sure. And then, and then went to Paramount. 
Well, he was not a contract. I think he has a freelance. Okay. But he, he, I don't I think he was ever on the contract, but he wrote with Richard Whiting at, at Warner Brothers. So, uh, uh, you're just too marvelous for words and hooray for Hollywood, things like that. Sure. And then he wrote a, wonderful, a lot of wonderful songs at Paramount, you know, for Buddy Hutton and, uh, uh, you know, with Harold Allen, et cetera. So, uh, you know, he, he works at every studio in town, I'm sure, yeah. Metro Fox, yeah. Can you two describe for me what it would have been like to be at either Warner Brothers or Paramount, say, oh, in the late 30s, early 40s? Much better than today, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there, was, there, was, there, was, there was a studio system there, it was a family. Yeah. Everybody helped each other, and it was, it was great. To and work. they made a lot more pictures, they made wonderful musicals, and that there was sanity to it all. And when you were hired for a picture, you know you were going, it was going to be made. And uh, let's say we were lucky. We were under contract at Paramount for ten years, and we went in, went went in every day, and essentially worked on a nine to five basis. But uh, the other, I mean, the Johnny Mercers and the Richard Whitings and the Harry Warren, they were hired from picture to picture, and they were always in demand. They could work wherever they wanted to and uh, whenever. But uh, the musicals were wonderful, and in our particular case, it was just so exciting to be part of a studio uh, studio ambiance. We, uh, at lunch in the commissary at Paramount, we had a music table, was right near the ent entrance, and the people from the music department and friends that there, or we knew would come and sit with us. And we had lunch many times with Bing Crosby, uh, Gary Cooper, Paulina we, Dietrich, yeah, we plus were, our music department. We were at the front table and we would capture people. And Gary Cooper came in to do High Noon, and we said, would you like to sit with us? And we said, well, that was for two months. Mm -hmm. We got Ryan and Dietrich. Yeah. We got Edward G. Robinson. Yeah. And Big Crosby all the time, because he loved the music people anyway, and he knew all of them. And you know, what a wonderful world that was for two kids, from which we were more or less in, from country towns, small towns, to be part of this world with, with all these stars, etc. And uh, I say, uh, without Johnny Mercer, <laughs> we'd probably be back in the small towns now, doing whatever uh, we would be doing there. I was sitting having lunch by myself, everybody had left. Bing Crosby came in. You got any songs I can record? Well, he was so big. <laughs> oh, boy. They had him say that, and we played uh, so Silver cool. Bells for him, which is our, our annuity. Sure, they sold 140 million records because yeah. every Christmas it sells millions. You Three know. or four million every Christmas. Yeah. I had a couple. Good. I thank you very much. Well, you made us four cents each year. So but maybe, anyway, I mean that's how it came out. The fact that we were there, meeting all these people, helped our career tremendously. You know, we lived there. And Big Crosby was always very nice to us. To a lot of people, he was cold and distant, but we never pushed or anything. And he was always very respectful and very, very nice. So, and we made an album once uh, for Capitol Records, which you know was part of the Johnny Mercer legacy. We conceived it, uh, in a sense, produced it, and wrote all the special material called that Traveling to Be for Big Crosby and Rosemary Clooney. Now, it wasn't a big seller or anything like that, but uh, Billy made the, the arrangements, and it's a, it occupies a prized place in both of our libraries because it was so good, and uh, I say it was a Capitol Records project, which indirectly stems from Johnny Mercy, even though 10 or 12 years later. It was about Dixieland music over the world, the yeah. Tubi, you know, that traveling to yeah. Taking standard songs of different countries, like Chow Chow Bambino and uh, uh, April in Portugal, like that, but doing them in a Dixieland, oh, uh, Vienna Woods, you know, from yeah, Vienna, yeah, and yeah, doing yeah. it with a, with a two-beat Dixieland beat, marching beat, and it came out by my standards and most of the, a lot of standards, very, very, it's a very, very good project, so I'm very uh, pleased that they say, I'm bringing it up because it was Capitol Records uh, produced it and, and did it, and that's you know, part of the Mer Mercer legacy. Now, being there every day, writing songs over and over again, mostly special material and some pop songs, has built a library, I didn't realize what we were doing. Our songs are played, those songs are played all over the world. Absolutely, sure, yeah. And it's been a great uh, annuity sure. for us because... Sure. Uh, Even a traveling two beat, which is not a big seller, but we get uh, royalties on it from, from England, from France, from Japan, and means that Germany, is, that, that record is in existence somewhere, and they're playing tracks on it in a foreign, uh, re foreign performance societies are, uh, uh, you know, tracking it down and paying us for it. Not very much, but as Jay said, the fact that it's all over the world, you don't realize what the, your, the influence of, of music can be. But you There's asked what it was like to be there. And yeah, that's that right. was it. Right. How were pictures assigned? If, if a lyricist coming in, say Johnny Mercer or you all coming out as a fairly new person. To yeah, play, right. How were lyricists linked with composers and how were pictures assigned uh -huh. and projects? Well, the music department said, with our, uh, the things we did, we were under contract there, so uh, 
Uh, they didn't have to go out and hire anybody. If a producer said, I like Livingston and Evans, or the head of the music department knew about a project coming up and said, why don't you use our contract composers, Livingston and Evans, uh, then, you know, they just uh, we were assigned, we are given a script, and to do it. Now, the other studios, they, nobody else had songwriters on their contract. As we said earlier, Jay said, uh, Jay told you, when we were hired, we were hired just to do songs for two real shorts and just fill her in. And then, of course, when two weeks own came along, then we got much better assignments. But the other Studios, the head of the music department and the producer or where director, whoever was ex involved in the, exec in the executive echelon, would decide who they wanted to go after, and then they'd go to the uh, for songs. I mean. Uh, who they wanted to write the music, who they wanted to write the lyrics, put people together. As we said, Johnny wrote with lots of different composers, and lots of different composers had different lyricists, and then they'd go to the agent or wherever and make an offer and see if they were the people wanted to work on this project, and if they did, then they were hired. If not, then they'd take another review. But it's just a case of going out in the open market and bidding for who, whose ever services the people in question, the producers and the makers of the picture, thought would be right for their project, and the, it went from there. Well, it was a very democratic place. It's sure a was. studio where the heads of the, of the studio ate in all in the same room. Walt Disney had his own dining room, Jack Warner did, sure. everybody, but we were all together there. And it was a democratic, wonderful place to work. Yeah, the head of the studio ate with the grips and the, uh, yeah. you know, the secretaries and said, I'm music table, we could have one, anybody we wanted there. So it was a different world at Paramount than the other studios and luckily we were part of it for 10 very, very satisfying years. Once the picture or project was underway, yes. from the songwriter's point of view, what were you given to start with, the script or whatever, and then, and then how did you interact with the process as uh, it was going along? The story, the script. We had to write yeah. a song to fit the script. Yeah. Which we generally indicated, or if we had any ideas, we could take, you know, suggest yeah. them. And also, who was going to sing it? If you had Dorothy Moore, you had a range of an octave, you know, and you had to write for her. Rosemary Pony, you could do almost anything you wanted. Well, right? Yeah, but everybody had their own style. Mm. Now, our big man there is Bob Hope. Our first picture was a Bob Hope picture, Mr. Bouquet, the first six months. And we worked for Bob Hope until about three years ago, regularly. Mm -hmm. We did uh, 12 movies for Bob. Well, was it that many? Yeah, at least. Plus special material for him and known his personal appearances. But you asked about the process. After we would write a song or songs, whatever, how many were required, or uh, little by little if it was a big musical, first we'd have to do them for the head of the music department, the man uh, under whom we worked. That if he, I mean, he would generally, you know, wouldn't say yes or no, he might make a suggestion here or there, but anyway, once we did it, then it was up to the producer and maybe the star and maybe the director or or a combination of three. Uh, once they, we had gone, uh, uh, submitted it to the head of the music department, then it would be an appointment made for any one of the three I just mentioned to hear them. And if they approved, then that was it. And it was given over to the arrangers and the uh, uh, and the uh, uh, the musicians, et cetera, et cetera, to uh, make the arrangement. Recording dates were set. And it was done for the soundtrack. And uh, then that became part of the finished picture when the picture was done. I would make a, a piano part. Yeah, that's pencil, right. I forgot about pencil piano part. And then out the door, the copyists would copy us beautifully in ink, and we didn't have to do anything. I said, well, what a luxury. Yeah. Just sat on the recording stage when they recorded it with the star or whatever, and uh, say, uh, you know, how much we liked it or didn't like it. Or, and Jenny, I always liked it, so there's no problem about that. And then, of course, then it went through all the processes of, of putting it in a movie. It had to be filmed on the set with the uh, singer uh, mouthing the words to the playback. Yeah. And then eventually put on the soundtrack, and the finished picture came out, and. Luckily, if you were lucky, you had a hit. If not, you didn't, but you had better luck next time. Well, a lot of the songs were not hit type songs. They were special material. Oh, sure, to advance a story or to tell, you know, what yeah. the, uh, the drama, the dramatic uh, impetus of uh, what the scene was. What happened to material that wasn't used? Did it go revert back to you all? No, no, no we were on anything we wrote belonged to Paramount Studio. We, they were the writer, legally. The, uh, uh, the studio was considered the writer of the song. And we were just hired hands who uh, did it for the studio, but they, they owned the copyright, correct? Yeah, they owned the copyright. What was that called? The, there's a technical term for it. Yeah, uh, it's writing for hire. Writing for hire, sure. Yeah. But the studio, in the contract legal terms, was the author of the words and music of the song, and that meant they owned the copyright. But the best thing about it was their publishing company was very good. Right. Very we honest. got royalties like we had nothing to do with studio writers' royalties. Right? Yeah. 
The royalties are more important than the salary. Absolutely. And Famous Music, their publishing company, was very good. They, they still were, are. One of the few that treats their standard songs, you know, haven't gone crazy about rock and roll. And they've got a lot of Johnny Mercy songs, you know, Moon River is one of them. And you have some tremendous Johnny Mercy songs. And uh, I'll remember you and Jay quoted before, accentuate the positive, they all belong to Famous Music. So uh, we both uh, have a uh, well, I hope Johnny has a famous has a memory of, of good memory of famous, and I know we do right now here. Okay, I'm going to break here and flip this All over. Right. Okay. Shirley probably <coughs> knew him, didn't she? Who did? I say Shirley. Shirley is his wife. Who does she might. Yeah, sure. She, she probably has well. some good stories about Johnny. Uh, well, oh, she's, really? Yeah, she's an we actress. Can, we can. I don't she, know if she'd want to. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Can, I just have to say in passing as she went by. Yeah. Well, we can ask her. All okay, right. While I'm out here. Um, in about the mid '50s, American music started to change. And oh, rock, mm -hmm. rock started to come. That's for sure. The yeah. end of a great, a great artistic, uh, uh, a, a great artistic part of America, which went down the drain. And say, if Johnny Mercer were alive today, he'd be as unhappy as uh, almost any standard writer would. He could not get a job any more than uh, you know George Gershwin could today. But anyway, that's beside the point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, we've heard that, that he saw this coming. And, and that's was right, sure. And he was very it. unhappy. He said, nobody wants me. I've heard him quoted that. Nobody wants me anymore, and I can't get a job. And it's gotten a lot worse since Johnny is no longer here. You know. Is it really? So if it was that bad then, in the 60s and early 70s, it'd be a thousand percent worse now. They so got, got the, the, the depressed in that area. That's right. Sure. And yet he had his biggest hit during the rock world, but that was the uh, Session Improved the Rule. I think Moon River probably is his biggest hit of any song he ever wrote, because it came at a different time and it's never well, stopped. when he got with Mancini, he had a new life. Yeah. You know, and Mancini was very big. And nothing like Moon River. Moon River. No, but I mean, he wrote a good song. Oh, time. sure, he always wrote good songs. The Days of Wine and Roses is a sure, classic. Sure, Raid was yeah. very, very good. Yeah, I never understood it, but so it was good, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I just wanted to sort of... Yeah, okay, go ahead, that. excuse me, yeah, sure. No, that's, that was pretty much that. Um, did you talk to, did songwriters talk among themselves any, if, when this all started to change? And was there... Well, I don't know, we used to, sometimes we used to go on these concerts, you know, then I wrote for charities and stuff, and you'd be moaning the fact that there was no, no Sammy Fain, who was a wonderful songwriter, used to be so unhappy, because there was no place for him, and Harry Warren awaited everybody all the time. <laughs> you know, that gave him a real ammunition to and he, he and Johnny wrote lots of songs together, so, but, uh, I mean, everybody from the era is gone except Jane and myself, there's nobody left from that era, so, at least, whatever we discuss then, you can't discuss now unless you've got, the, you know, oh, a we, pipeline to, you know, the nether, you know, to the upper regions, et cetera, or the lower regions. We got together a lot, so I But you didn't talk, you didn't talk about the business that much, I don't think. I think so. Well, yeah, you sure. know, anybody, the doctors get together, they talked about medicine, yeah, they talked about but you, you, We never had... I mean, I never had social things just with songwriters. That, uh, as I say, when we had these concerts, you'd talk about it, you know, uh, how the world has changed, etc. But uh, that's a matter of, you know, it's an, a subjective opinion as how much we'd talk about how the world had changed. But nobody was happy. I know the Sammy Fains and the uh, Johnny Hughes was starting to get very unhappy. Well, Harry Warren was miserable. Oh, well, it was, he was miserable all the time anyway. <laughs> sure, sure. But we're the last ones left of that one, era. One so. of the things nobody knows <clears throat> is that they used to hire songwriters, and the background scores wrote the dramatic music. All of a sudden, they decided they were going to do the songs. The background writers? Yes. Oh. And they killed the music writers. A lot of them, yeah. Well, yeah. Harry Warren couldn't work after yeah, that. Yeah, but I mean, if they did do, by any chance, a big music, which they did do rarely, mm. then you'd hire songwriters, you know. Was but not for title songs yeah. or your background. But all these songs these fellows wrote, uh, they needed lyric writers, so we started writing lyrics as a team for other people, from Mancini, yeah. Max Schneider, David Rose, mm -hmm. Neil Hefty. That's how we kept going, because mm -hmm. they weren't hiring music. That's right, right, right yeah, yeah. For individual songs, anyway, for any big musicals, he would. But by that time, the big musicals had started to disappear yeah. too because of television. And, but of course, Johnny latched down to Henry Mancini. They wrote a lot together, and that was a good composer to work with. Now, what happened in that era was. There'd be five nominated songs at the Academy nobody ever heard. Sure. Because these composers were wonderful musicians, but they couldn't write, most of them couldn't write songs. Mancini could. Yeah, that's right. Uh, Michelle Legrand. Johnny, Johnny Mandela. Johnny in Mandela. the jazz, but very jazz. Yeah. yeah. But uh, they wrote with their heads. I see where I can put it. They would sit down and write interesting melodies, but they weren't songs. There were no heart, no feeling. You're right with your feeling, with your stomach. Yeah, you from know? the heart. It's instinct. Yeah, right. They didn't have that. Yeah. 
And that's why there are no hits on out of movies for a long time. And now, of course, it's all rock. And who, I don't even remember what was nominated or what won last year or the year before that. And the rock thing has become just ridiculous. You know, the, I, I think they ought to cancel the Best Song Award because the songs are just so unimportant and they have nothing to do with the success of a movie. The award was set up, the Oscar Award, for a song that helped a movie and advanced the story and it was important in the movie, not just something that got on the hit parade because they know some rock artists recorded it. Now what happens now is they very seldom hire anybody to write right. a song. Mm -hmm. They take songs and stick them in. Mm -hmm. They don't tell story, they're just stuck in there, you know. Mm -hmm. And we had to write uh, a tailor-made song we all did in those days, Seriously. so that era is gone. You were part of the, except for the Disney people, apparently these guys, uh, Mencken and whomever. Oh, he's wonderful. Yeah, the last three, two, three years, they won the Oscar the best song, and they're operating more or less in the old way, in the old, because these are not rock pictures, they're pictures with stories, even though they're cartoons or whatever, and they have a dramatic, there's a dramatic reason to be for the song being done, not just to sell a soundtrack or be number one on the, and a, r a rhythm and blues. Now, Alan Menken will win the Oscar every year now. He's of course, the he's the only one yeah, who does those. He's the only songs. real songwriter left. And, and the basis of the bulk of the Academy of Members are going to appreciate and vote for those kind of songs. Yeah. Because they, they don't want rock. It's rock junk. Well, it's yeah. an older group that I'm into rock. Well, there's I mean, some young ones too, yeah. but even that, these things are much more, they're, they're more musical. And they're also in big successful pictures, which doesn't hurt, you know. These, the, these, these Disney pictures are tremendous hits, yeah. <clears throat> so when things started changing in the 50s, did the studios simply close down the songwriting into their music department? Yeah, yeah. 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 nobody in the country. The two, the two big changes are rock. The other one is the background composers decided they were going to write all the songs in their pictures. They, would, they wouldn't score it. Mm -hmm. And that's what changed uh, yeah. the whole song. Unless they brought in a Cole Porter or somebody like that, then they they have to. Well, this was after Cole Porter was gone. This all happened. Yeah, well, it happened in the 60s, too. Yeah. You know, it's what it really started with Tiamkin, and he was in the late 50s, 60s. You know, yeah. He said, I'm going to write this one. Anyway, that's, you know, it's, a, it's not, not an important thing. Well, that's, that's a big started. important thing. It shows how the music Oh, yeah, changed. sure. But I mean, when it started, when I think. Sure. Well, it changed with yeah. rock. But then, of course, the culture became rock. and. You know, and the pictures like Saturday Night Fever, and those that with the soundtrack sold, you know, gross more than the movies did, even though the movies were successful. And he had several like that, and that's the way everybody went. You know, it's like a, uh, like following the sheep. And uh, so now it's completely, you know, that's the only way they, uh, the, the, that they operate. Except guys like Woody Allen, who used wonderful standard songs in his background music. And I understand he's, he's going to do a musical with actual songs in, so that will be something with class, I'm sure. I, I don't I don't speak against rock that much anymore. It's so big that there must be something there that attracts people, you know. Well, it attracts them. Now, if we were starting now, we'd be writing rock. You yeah. know that. We, we would grow well, in. Well, if we, you you would be part of your the only culture, you would know. We would have grown up with it. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Because you wouldn't know anything else. That's but, right. Uh, but by the same token, uh, you know. Well, by our standards, we don't like it. Yeah. Well, but by the standards of art. You know, you like comparing Picasso with a comic strip. What you what is art? Picasso with a comic strip. You know, this is for the eight, twelve-year-old mentality, fifteen-year-old, and uh, uh, lyrics that Johnny Mercer would be horrified by. Music you don't can't sing or whistle. So where is the art? I mean, I don't, I'm not trying to say that people shouldn't listen to rock, but it's not beautiful. But what happened? It's ugly. The, the music is gone. Yeah, you and no lyrics. No, yeah. The, well, the lyrics of some are very good. Yeah. You can't play a rock song without the lyric. There's no melody there. So you can't make an instrumental record of it. And that's the big difference. There's no melody to play, mm -hmm. except in very rare circumstances. Sometimes in Nashville, a country song will come out that's pretty good. Good music, like, uh, what's that real good one? Uh, the Wind Beneath My Wing. That's oh, a wonderful sure. song. Oh, sure. That's one in ten years. I know. I'm sure, that's such a no rare. But at least the country songs have words in music. Oh, no question of that. Yeah. Sure, they're not Johnny Mercer words in music, no. but they're. Uh, but at least they do make sense, and they they tell a story of some kind. And as Jay said, Wind Beneath Wind Beneath My Wings. That's a classic song. That would be good in any genre, any generation. The thing they can do now is they can write about anything. I mean, we sure were can. more restricted. They can write anything they want. And they can write about, you know, she, she went off in a pickup truck with this guy and mm -hmm. so forth, you know, and all uh, st uh, stories we would not have written, mm -hmm. you know. 
and four letter words you can do yeah, and four letter yeah. words you know it uh, and the radio station play them you know yeah. I wouldn't dare quote some of the lyrics that I've heard or read about and I don't hear them because I don't listen to these things but it's just incredible that you can say these things in songs and be out and buy them and think it's great you well know? there's a big movement now movement now well, stop that, that, they, they can't you can't censor yeah. it's impossible yeah. the only people that are stopping are the parents that said don't buy, let these kids buy these records yeah. you have to go, uh, take care of their kids because if an adult wants that kind of stuff, fine, because you hear those words in movies. Yeah. You hear them, but it's shocking when you hear them sung, you know, and, the, and rhyme is all gone. There's no Johnny Mercer, that's one of the great things, the rhymes he had and the interplay of rhymes and all that. Today, that doesn't exist. They don't even worry about it. No, uh, they just... Well, it's inevitable that things change. You know, you well, can't fight it. but they've it. gone down the rail. That's what well, I mean, it's gone yeah, down by the our range, standards, you know? yeah. And I started off this, this part segment of our talk, and art, and art, Form has completely disappeared. Yeah. My cliche is if George Gershon were alive today, he'd be on a corner of the tin cup. He could not be heard if he were writing the way George Gershon. There'd be no place for him to be heard, which is a sad commentary on you our see, society. The men that run the record companies are all young, in their 30s at least, and they're into rock. So if they heard a good song, they wouldn't know. What but they wouldn't record song? it anyway. If they liked it, they wouldn't record but, it. But they wouldn't know it. Yeah, you know, they, well, that could they wouldn't be recognize sure. it. Yeah, you know? it's possible. They're not into that. So it's yeah. just a new world. I don't fight it. I mean, they expect, well, you can't, sure. they expect yeah. things yeah. to change, you know. Yeah, but not for the worse. You expect to be, there should be a room for everything. There should be room for great art. There should be room for rock. There should be room for nonsense country. And the art is gone. Well, you know yeah. what happens now? These rock artists own their publishing company, oh. they own their record company, and they make money like you can't believe. Yeah, but their songs amazing. go up like a rocket and disappear. Sure. And we're, we're better off because our songs have never gone away. Till, yeah, until they run out of copyright, and then, then of course it'll be public domain, but yeah. I mean, uh, our, we'll never be alive when ours run out of copyright. Johnny will lose some of the copyright because he wrote in the 30s, and uh, in the year 2000 there's going to be some that'll go out of copyright. but. Uh, uh, but the rock things, you know, they go up and down. But the money they make is incredible. Isn't it? Uh, you know, the Beatles really started the rock revolution, but by today's standards, their stuff is practically classical. Yeah. You know, so with George Gershon, because they do have rhymes and they have melodies, you know. They're, they're not Johnny Mercer rhymes or Cole Porter melodies or George Gershon melodies, but compared with the heavy stuff and the metal and the, the stuff that you hear today, you know, uh, they're geniuses. You know, so. But it all started with the Beatles, you know, and the Vietnam War. That had a big social... And movement. Elvis did a lot. Well, yeah, but he was before the Beatles. And yeah. he was more rhythm and blues, you know. Yeah. And, uh, you know the, Woogie Woogie kind of, the 12 beat uh, kind of thing. Yeah. yeah, sure. But of course, you know, he changed, the, uh, gave a big input to the Nashville kind of music. And then the Beatles came along with the uh, adolescent kind of music, which I say sounds very civilized today. And then the rock, you know, the heavy metal and the junk really came in. So that's where we are as far as my philosophy of the music world. A lot of the songs aren't written, they're put together in the sure, studio. Sure. They say, you do this and you try that. Yeah, sure. And they have 32 tracks mm -hmm. and they keep trying things and it takes days and weeks. Sure. Whereas in our era, an orchestrator would make an orchestration that was balanced. Sure. And they had one mic, so all they needed in the front to pick it up. That's the big difference. And so many of these guys say artists can't read music or write music, two of them, even though they own the song and you know somebody else, they have to go and kind of hum it or you know put it together, as Jay said, you know, for it takes weeks after weeks after weeks to make the the records, and of course that costs a fortune. By the same token, they sell you know millions and millions when you have a hit today, so it comes out okay in the end as far as the record company and the artist is concerned. But in the old days, you didn't do that. You made a recording and you made a, an arrangement and then you recorded it. They had a three-hour session to do two or three songs. Yeah, maybe even four, you know, sure. Yeah. But the thing, uh, the thing I remember most was Elvis came to Paramount. And we were always prepared. It was all orchestrated, all written, ready to go. He went into the studio with no, nothing, no ideas and started creating. And hours went by. And Walter Sharp was a composer, conductor. And he yeah. came and he said, you don't know what happened today. This guy came in with no idea what he was going to do, and that's when it started. They created as they went, you know, and added track. They would add a rhythm track, then they would try horns, then they'd yeah. take them out. But they must have a song written before they get entered. They, they had an idea. Yeah. But I mean, oh, they, kept, I, yeah, they yeah. kept changing it. Okay, sure, yeah, yeah, sure. And they must have words to or you didn't, you yeah, didn't have to live but they them. kept changing them a lot. Yeah, sure. Yeah. 
But that took a lot of time, and that studio overhead, that's not a cheap. But his pictures made money, they did well, so it was worth it, you know. But today it's even worse, because at least he had a little musical background, and mm -hmm. so many of the guys today, you know, they bite off chicken heads on when they're on the stage. <laughs> you know, that's right, Ozzy Osbourne, somebody's telling me if the, they saw him at a party the other day, uh, uh, or oh, at the Beverly Hills Hotel, it's at Beverly Hills Hotel, and they were talking about how when he performs, he has a live chicken and bites off his head, and that's part of the performance. Oh, right? God. Right. <laughs> but that's, you know, that's, that's for the world, and all the tattoos on the people, and, you know, and et cetera, and, and the drugs and stuff. You know, I'm not trying to be a moralist, I'm just saying that ugliness is, is superseded, taken over from art, artistry and beauty. And there should be a place for everything, but there's no place for the artistry and beauty today, which I'm repeating myself, I know, but out of a different reason, yeah. Okay, I don't have any particularly other, particular other questions. Um, I do want to verify that back at the very beginning of this, this whole recording, uh -huh. um, you mentioned that you all met Mercer in between his shows when they went to, was it the Tropicana? Uh, Key Club. Key Club. Key Club. It was called the Tropics. That's oh, right. the Tropics. Okay, okay. See, they had three hours between shows. And it was right across the street. Right, right across from NBC. Yeah. So they went over there and they eat and drink. Yeah, right? that was a cor almost a corner of Hollywood and Vine, uh, Sunset and Vine. Yeah, it was. Yeah. Now, NBC, the networks would not play a recording. It was a hard and fast rule. Uh -huh. So they couldn't record the first show that went to the East. And they had to do it all over again. And every show was done that way. Two times. It must have been hard. Up. Yeah. Well, they got paid for it, and uh, and you know Johnny was singing on the show, and uh, he was the MC, and they had the Pied Piper, and they had Joe Stafford. So, and I don't know, it was a fifteen minutes or a half hour. I think it was fifteen minutes. I think too. So yeah. it was really only a half hour, and you, you after you did it once, and you just repeated what you had done before. So you had to. But I don't know why the networks. Well, they didn't have. To, uh, uh, Tape or tape then. Sure. Yeah. And, and also a union thing because the mu musicians probably got paid for two seconds. They got paid twice. Yeah, yeah sure. So I mean the, the union had a lot more strength then and I'm sure that didn't add that much to the cost of a show. So rather than fight the union out it do it twice. But as Jay said, they didn't have the tape quality then to do it uh, you know, on tape. Yeah. We're talking about the middle forties now, you know, that's yeah. fifty some years ago. Yeah, they would have had those discs. Yeah, Different yeah. Discs. Yeah. And those were not easy to make. I don't know if you could make those right away and then have them play back three hours later. Whatever, they didn't do it that way. They did two shows, yeah. Big Crosby was the one that upset that. He said, I'm going to record my shows. And that broke the rule. And his shows were recorded on a big disc, 15 inch discs. Because he wanted to do it when he wanted to do it, then go fishing or something, you know? <laughs> yeah. And after that, they began to record. But he didn't record on disc, the yeah. show. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Before tape. But yeah. today with the tape, you know, you don't know the difference. Oh, tape is fantastic. Yeah. Like what you're doing here. I'm sure this is going to come out very, you know, whether the material is worth it or not, but the quality <laughs> is going to be very good, yeah. Now the material is certainly well, good. Well, okay. Only time will tell. You, edit, you probably edit this, don't you? Uh, what we'll do is transcribe this and you all get to see it and oh. correct and make, you know, if we've made any oh. mistakes. Oh, okay. And, and then do you edit it yourself after that or you? No, you know, it'll just, be just the way we're talking? Oh let's transcribe it, yeah. Yeah, but yeah. what you've done over an, over an hour, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Come, coming up on an hour anyway. And what do you do then? Index it for the files and then that, yeah. It'll be available for researchers yeah. to use. How many do you think you'll have? How many tapes will you have by the time you're finished? You okay. say you've got six or seven already. I'd say at least 25. That many? We, we just did something for the Smithsonian Institute for their archives. Oh. Uh, 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 an audio, yeah. then they had a show in a the theater. And uh, we performed for an hour and a half. And filmed, it was filmed, yeah. And it's in the archives of Smithsonian, and ASCAP also took a copy. Really? So yeah. we're in their archives so now. So that's you very flat, so now we're in two archives. <laughs> right here, yeah. We're pleased to have you. Well, thank you. Uh -huh. yeah. If I ever get to Atlanta, you know, for the next Olympics, and I'll look it up. You know? <laughs> but Atlanta's on my hate list because of my Olympic experience. For Are you sure going to any, any of the games or anything? You have, you have some tickets in? I have baseball and I have horses. Oh, really? Yeah. Well, horses are probably easier to get, yeah. I got one baseball, which, you know, that's the opening and the closing and the basketball championship, and I've had that at every previous Olympics, but not this one. So all right. A pox on Atlanta, sure. Well, and well, we were told, well, you know, well, if you had a lot of money for in the crowd, you could have anything you wanted. The in crowd of so much corruption and right? under the table. So, And we heard that from very good sources, so nothing we can do about that. But uh, anyway, next time we know, grease the palm first before you <laughs> set, uh, uh, make your application.
Well, before we close this, do either of you have any final thoughts, comments, or whatever that you want to add yeah, about well, Mr. Mercer? No. no, I think we said it all. We said yeah, anything I can remember. Sure. We said that he started our whole career, mm -hmm. recommended me to Paramount, yeah. and that's what did it. And became a good friend along yeah. the way. And uh, you know, I was always very uh, uh, appreciative of the fact that I was a friend of Johnny Mercer to whatever degree, and that was a feather in my cap with somebody as important and talented as he, but to consider me. You know, part of his family or part of his uh, social life, and that was always very nice. We all became equals in the end because we all That's worked in sure. pictures. Sure, and all loved ASCAP, and uh, and he started the Hall of Oh, for then he started the Sound Greatest Hall of Fame in New York, as you know. Yeah. And we were one of the first put in that, not the very first year, but the third or fourth year. So we have another accolade, which is a part of the Johnny Mercer legend, because we're in the Hall of Fame and earlier uh, early entrance in there. I can't speak highly enough about his talent. Mm -hmm. It was the greatest. I think that tops it all, doesn't it? I think it does. <laughs> well, he was one of the. He was among the greatest. I yeah. thought he was the greatest. Okay, fine, yeah. <laughs> tomorrow might be some. Tomorrow you might want uh, somebody else. Well, I don't think so. One of these rock guys. I was a great of Edmund Meyer. Yeah, who uses the four-letter words which I could quote, but I wouldn't in front of this lady. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to thank you both. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I think that does it for this one. Okay, good. Uh -huh. Well, I hope that you had tape in there and it all worked. Yeah. <laughs> I think it did. Yeah, now, do you have another interview this afternoon? No.